from Microbe TV. This is Twin This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 39, recorded on April 18th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hi, Vincent. Good to be back. Wow, 39. It's a long way from 1,000, Jason. I Yeah, it seems un- unbelievable, 1,000. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> Maybe 1,000 for, for twin is unattainable. I don't know. It's just Well, it is if you're doing once a month, yeah. <laughs> also joining us from New York, Tim Chung. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, I, don't, I can't count to more than, I don't know, 50. <laughs> Tim was at the 1000 uh, TWIV on Saturday night because Tim is not too far away here in New yeah, York. It was it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and, and people said, that's Tim Chung? He sounds so much older. Uh, <laughs> uh, they thought you all looked I very young. I can speak in a higher register in a Mickey Mouse voice. <laughs> that's what people want. Uh, we have a guest today. We're doing a paper from, or preprint from Jason's laboratory, and we have... Uh, the first author here from Salt Lake City, Junji Shu. Welcome to Twin. Hello, Vincent. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Junji from Jason Shepard Lab. Um, I did my undergrad at Sichuan University, China. Uh, after yeah. that, um, uh, in 2019, I moved to U.S. to pursue my PhD um, in Jason's lab. Now I'm oh, a fourth so- year on a uh, fourth year. PhD student. So I have to ask you, how's, is Jason a good mentor? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. He's a good. <laughs> he has to say that. <laughs> yeah, of course. Of course. I, I asked one of my students, I taught a class and I, uh, did I do a good job? And the, and the professor, I was a guest, he said, How, how is she going to say no where well, you're standing right here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Well, thanks for joining us. You have a very cool preprint. Um, actually, so my colleague, Amy, uh, sent it to me yesterday. She said, why don't you do this on twin? <laughs> and so, uh, it is, it, it's a bioarchive preprint. How long ago did you submit this? February 9th, right? Yeah. So wow. it's been up for a little bit. It's under, it's actually under review at cell. So, hmm. um, good. hoping for good reviews, but we'll see. So PNMA2 forms non-envelope virus-like capsids that trigger Paraneoplastic neurological syndrome, and Junji is the first author, and uh, Jason is is the last. And I see Cedric Fischat is on this too. Uh, mm-hmm. Jason, yeah, we've got a long standing collaboration with Cedric's lab, and you know, coming back to when he was at Utah, um, he's helped us do a lot of the phylogenetics um, in a collaboration. Mm-hmm. But the whole theme of of uh, transposable elements doing things. That's that's also what he's interested in. Yeah, exactly. So tell us about some of the other authors, what what, what their roles have been. Um, so really the, the other authors are, the main other collaborators were um, Simon Erlinson from John Briggs's lab. And uh, John and Simon did the cryo-EM reconstruction of the, the capsids that we're going to talk about. Um, and so that they provided all the structural uh, data for, for the capsid. Um, and then the rest of the um, authors, uh, there's a couple of folks from my lab who helped with um, generating the primary neurons that Junji used for his experiments. And then um, some clinical collaborators where we got some uh, patient samples that that we'll discuss, and um, mm. they coordinated um, get, getting us some uh, cere- cerebral spinal fluid to test. Quite a international group. We have Cambridge, we have Denmark, Germany, Jacksonville, Florida, Colorado. <laughs> yeah, I, this is how science should be done. Really, I mean, this is I mean, this is what's fun about science is that you you have all these collaborators all over the world and. We'll, we'll all speak the same language. All right. So, Jace, maybe you could give us the big big picture view. PNMA2, what is that? Yeah. So, um, 
We, I think we discussed um, one of our papers a long time ago on uh, another gene called ARC, ARC. And um, so my lab has been predominantly interested in learning in memory and sort of how um, cells store information. And we were working on this gene that we knew is absolutely essential for making long-term memories uh, in mice. And um, we were interested in its biochemistry and how it worked in cells. And then we made this weird discovery that that neuronal gene can actually encode proteins that form these viral-like capsids. Um, and that's taken us down a, a really interesting rabbit hole about trying to figure out what ARC is doing, why does it form these capsids, and its function in the brain. But one sort of big question that came out of that was whether there are other genes that could also have sort of similar evolutionary history. We had, when we, when we sort of looked into the history of, of, of ARC, we f found that it's most, um, most like uh, a retrotransposon, so one of those um, transposable elements that are probably ancestral to the retroviruses. And many of those protein domains, as you know, are conserved between the retrotransposons and, and the retroviruses, including that capsid protein domain that's necessary and sufficient to make viral capsids. Um, and so we knew that there was um, a bunch of other genes in, in mammals that had predicted uh, homology, structural homology to those retroviral proteins. And there was this one family called the PNMA family that we were interested in because they were also highly expressed in the brain and being neuroscientists, of course, we wanted to follow up on any um, uh, proteins that could form capsids that were also expressed in the brain. Uh, and so when Junji joined the lab, um, his first experiments were just to take a, a few of those proteins and purify them and see if they could form capsids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then we would, you know, follow up on that. Um, but the other reason why this gene family is interesting is so this, this PNMA um, name actually stands for uh, paraneoplastic um, antigen protein. And so paraneoplastic uh, syndromes are these uh, autoimmune syndromes that ha actually happen a lot when you have cancers, partly because uh, the tumors in cancers express all these weird proteins that are not normally expressed outside the brain, for example, or they're expressed at high levels. Um, and so the immune system ends up attacking those proteins. And so you get antibodies that are generated to those proteins. But what's interesting um, with these disorders is that there, there's a very specific neurological um, symptoms that come with that disease. And actually, a lot of these patients come in first to the clinic because of the, they have these neurological um, symptoms and they don't know they have cancer. And so eventually... Um, the diagnosis uh, is is a form of cancer, and the most um, can the the predominant cancers that are associated with this these uh, particular disorders are testes and lung cancer. Um, but uh, a lot of these antibodies that are generated um, to neuronal proteins make sense. Uh, for example, there are there are usually receptors that are on the cell surface, and so when they're expressed outside the brain. Um, they can be identified by um, by the immune system, but these proteins, this PNMA family, they're they're predicted to not be receptors. They don't have any of those transmembrane domains. So it's sort of been a puzzle of why these particular proteins would be immunogenic. So with that sort of preamble, that's that sort of gave us uh, um, a lot of impetus to try and figure out what what these proteins are actually doing. Um, cause other than their predicted homology to these retroviral domains, pretty much no other publications are out there about what they actually do in the brain. So a completely, um, unknown function. Now just, sorry, can I quickly ask, like, are these proteins identified by patients, um, these patients showing neurological symptoms, people guessing they have some autoimmune antibody, 
and then people trying to pull down with antibodies that somehow manage a fish using antibody to pull these proteins down. Yeah, so I think generally what happens is that um, once they they sort of guess that it's it's an autoimmune disorder, they run a panel of different antibodies um, to diagnose the, the 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 disease, and so um, PNMA one and two are the two most common uh, PNMA proteins that where there are antibodies, but they usually are run with a panel of other. Um, common proteins like NMDA receptor, mm. GABA receptors. Um, and also it's, uh, there seems to be a spectrum. So some, in some cases, um, the only order antibodies generated or observed are PNMA1 and 2, uh, whereas in other cases, there's a whole panel of different autoimmune um, antibodies that could be causal for the neurological symptoms. So it's a bit messy. Mm. Um, but in general, and you know, we can, we've got access, we ha- end up actually getting access to some patient, um, samples where there was a long history of the cancer. They were treated. They had, um, a, 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 a positive diagnosis for PNMA one and two. Um, and I think two out of the three samples we got, um, there was, those were the predominant autoantibodies that were in the mm-hmm. blood. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Junji, t- t- tell us how you started to work on this. Uh, give give us an overview of what you did. Okay, so um, when I did the rotation uh, in Jason's lab, I just come, <laughs> came to Jason's office and say, Arc capsids, it's a super interesting. I want to work on the capsids stuff uh, in neurons because um, originally I'm also interested in virus, so I want to work on the capsid. Um, then Jason said there is a bunch of protein uh, that we can um, characterize whether they can form capsids. Then I pick up PMA, I did some screen, and we found that PMA2 is a pretty interesting protein that can also form capsids. Then we decided to work on PMA2. Um, and I'll say that um, when the first experiments that Junji did, um, he screened a few of these and uh, he didn't really try too hard to change any parameters based on what we had known for ARC. And we got those first images for PNMA2 and they were just amazing, just beautiful. You could see they were looked like stars. They were super, super um, homogenous. And um, so when we saw that, I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> clearly this is, this is a, a, a capsid forming protein. So, so you say in the first part here that this is, um, you could you could sort of figure out when this arose in evolution, right? How'd you do that? Yeah, so that's where we collaborated with um, Cedric Vachat's group. So Manu Singh um, in his lab did the phylogenetics where, you know, these days we've got all these RNA sequencing databases where you can look at expression profiles um, and in different species and also, of course, look at the... Um, the different sequences that are in in those species as well, and so they used um, you know computational phylogenetics to to look at the different sequences and determine um, which species had the gene and how conserved with, uh, was the gene between species. And so for this actual this PMA two is kind of interesting. Um, it's a gene that's pretty conserved in mammals but in no other species. So it seems to be a much uh, more recent uh, mm. evolutionary uh, repurposing event than arc, for example, which we think happened between birds and um, fish or amphibians and fish. Um, and so in mammals, this gene is highly conserved in placental mammals, but not so much in marsupials. So even within mammals, it, it was a much more recent uh repurposing event. Um, and we think it's um, derived from this family of retrotransposons called the, the TY3 family, that this is the same family that, that ARC um, is also derived from. So um, there's a lot of similarities there with the, the ancestral retrotransposon. 
Um, and what's cool is that they um, Manu could actually figure out where in the genome this retrotransposon inserted itself, and then basically evolution took advantage of of this gene mm -hmm. at some point. Um, and um, this happens a lot where these retrotransposons jump into the genome, but if they jump right in a good place where there's existing sequences that were allowed to be expressed, like prom promoters and enhancers, that helps it become um, expressed in that organism. So, Junji, this <clears throat> first figure, you have expression experiment in uh, a brain. Tell us about that. Um, so, after we got the um, expression data, the uh, RNA seq data from Manu, we want to confirm those um, sequencing data with the wet lab experiment. So, we mm -hmm. uh, did the RNA scope uh, in situ hybridization. Um, to test whether we can see PMA2 RNA um, in the brain, whether it's uh, widely expressed across different brain regions. So yeah, we did the RNA scope and we found the PMA2 RNA is uh, abundant there uh, across the whole brain, um, including the cortex, hippocampus, uh, amygdala, uh, and so on and so forth. So basically PMA2 is a highly expressed and also widely expressed gene in the brain. And you don't find it outside the brain, is that right? Yeah, um, we haven't, do, uh, haven't done any um, wet lab experiment to test that, but based on the RNA sequencing results, yes, okay. yeah, PMA2 is primarily <clears throat> in the brain. And it's also and it, it, only expressed in neurons, which is interesting. It's not expressed in glia, for example, in, in, in the brain. Mm -hmm. uh, nor astrocytes. Right, no astrocytes. Oh. So these are mouse sections, Junji, right? You, yeah. you did these? Oh, know. yeah. That's a mouse uh, brain uh, uh, with two to three uh, uh, months old. Right. Do you think it is not expressed in peripheral neurons, like the enteric neurons? So based on those databases that, that are out there, it doesn't look like it's expressed there. But mm. yeah, I mean, we we probably need to, to actually look at that at some point. Um, but those databases suggest that it's really not expressed anywhere except the brain. Okay. So, Jinji, in that same figure, there are what look to me like virus particles. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah. So um, at the beginning, um, it took, some, uh, took us uh, about three or uh, four months to finally um, be able to purify this protein. And uh, the first time when I took the grid with the protein on it, uh, under the EM, I was so excited to see, you know, all the, <laughs> your field of view is full of those capsids. Um, and it's also show some difference from ARCA capsids. Um, so it, it was a very, exciting afternoon when I got those uh, image. Um, yeah, I can see they yeah. look beautiful. Yeah. And then I presume you then gave it to your collaborator. That's the cryo-EM uh, reconstruction there, right? Yeah. Um, then we reach out to John Breck's lab and uh, mm -hmm. um, when they saw, uh, saw those capsids, they find it's a super, the shape kind of super homo, uh, hom homo, Homogenous. Oh, yeah, homogenous. And uh, they decided to do some cryo EM reconstruction on those capsids. I, I have a dumb question as a known, very much a known biologist, um, which is if you look at figure one, so this, I just want to um, uh, emphasize this paper is on Bar Archive, so it's open access to anyone who wants to look at it. Yeah. Um, but in figure one, there are these electron micrograph, electron microscope pictures of these capsid proteins, and they look very, they like tiny little pasta, kind of each one looks the same. <laughs> um, but I'm wondering, um, are there no non viral proteins that would form this kind of um, shapes by its, if you purify them a bunch? Like, are these very um, kind of, you look at it and you think definitely virus, and only virus can make these kind of. Repeatable, repeatable shapes. 
Um, no. So, I mean, there are many um, proteins that can form large structures or large oligomers. Um, there's coat proteins like clathrin, for example. Hmm. Um, but they all have distinctive shapes, of course. And um, this was sort of the interesting thing about when we first uh, took images of arc capsids, um, we were actually, I was thinking that there, there may be a coat protein because we, we knew arc was involved in endocytosis. Um, but, but when we showed these, those images to virologists, they're like, no, that's a, that's a virus. Oh. And so it does seem like, you know, especially retroviruses have very distinctive, um, symmetry and, and morphology. And, um, and when, so we've collaborated with John's lab, uh, for, for a while and we have a paper on the the fly arc capsids and uh it's a similar story there where just for whatever reason the the prep when we purified the the fly arc proteins that are really homogenous and easy to do single particle reconstruction using cryo mm. um but john said to me look if i didn't know this protein was actually from an animal i would have thought you discovered a new virus that's how uh -huh. close they look to mm. um viral capsids and it's the same thing for, for this one. Um, the, this is, uh, also has a costal hedral sy symmetry, so it's made of pentamers and, and, and hexamers. Um, actually, I think this is this this um, this form of the capsid. It's a T equals one, so it's probably the smallest capsid mm. you can make with those subunits. Um, so yeah. it's quite small, um, but it has that distinctive retroviral. Um, capsid shape to it okay yeah t i was just going to ask you what's the t number t equals one yeah one uh subunit per structural unit right yeah that's the smallest size capsid you can make 60 so 60 copies of the p m n m a2 protein exactly right? so junji is there anything inside these capsids um, based on, so we purified those capsids from E. coli, use the affinity purification oh, cool. and the cryo EM structure, um, uh, also based on the E. coli, e. coli um, derived, uh, PMA2, uh, capsids and, uh, based on the cryo EM uh, data, we cannot see anything inside. It's pretty much, pretty much empty. And also, uh, we found that the interior surface of the, um, Caps is pretty negative, so we probably think there is no RNA that can be encapsulated by those capsids. It could be some other cargoes. Hmm. So there's yeah, there's, so a, far, there's a lot of weird uh, puzzles here, and um, this is one of them. So uh, as you all know, viruses carry nucleic acids in their capsids, and that's what they evolved to do is to protect nucleic acids in their genome. Uh, whether it's RNA or DNA. Mm -hmm. And here, um, you've got a very small capsid. They're about 20, 20 nanometers in diameter. Inside the capsid, no idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so there's a couple of possibilities, but we could probably come back to that at the end. Um, but right now, this is puzzle number one, which is to say, why would you form this capsid structure if there's no... Um, RNA inside. Right. Is ARC have something in it, Jason? So ARC does have RNA and it, it, it can ca encapsulate its own mRNA for sure. Yeah. And we think we there may actually be some non-coding small RNAs as well. Um, so so this, G, yeah. this protein, this capsid has a, a really distinctive set of qualities that's different to ARC. All right, so, so next, Junji, you said um, you looked at whether these are released from cells and if, whether they had an envelope or not. So what what's the idea behind that? Yeah, so we know that um, virus capsids usually can be released and, uh, we all, and also ARC capsids can be released. So then we want to mm. test whether PMA2 capsids can also be released um, from cells. Um, Actually, first uh, we did a simple experiment um, by just uh, overexpressing PMA2 protein in the hex cell and test whether we can detect PMA2 um, in the media. And uh, we did that, we can detect, so that's good. Um, this is the overexpression model and also it's a cell line model. We want to uh, then move on to the uh, neuronal culture. So 
we harvest, we culture the uh, primary cortical neuronal uh, culture, and then we harvest the media um, from the culture, um, doing the size exclusion chromatography to fractionate the media. Um, we get the particle fraction and the protein monomer fraction, and then we did the Western. So the result show we can detect PMA2 in the particle fraction. So that's give us a strong um, implication that probably PMA2 can be released um, uh, by neurons as a capsid. Mm. And uh, yeah, that's the uh, original idea. And then we want to test whether it's enveloped capsids or non-enveloped capsids, because it's a kind of two types of virus enveloped, mm -hmm. non-enveloped, and also ARC is released inside the vesicle. Um, what about PMA2? So we um, uh, did a protease K prote protection assay. Um, still, we use a, a media from a neuronal culture without overexpressing PMA2, the endogenous PMA2. Mm -hmm. um, and the, we, when we did the protease K without uh, adding, adding any... What's uh, protease K? Remember that not everyone is going to know what these things are. Um, protease K basically is a protease that can degrade um, proteins. So uh, without the proteins, uh, without the detergent, you can imagine protease K can only degrade all the non-enveloped protein. All the protein inside the vesicle will be protected uh, from protein mm -hmm. protease K degradation. So the results show PMA2 without the detergent still can be De degraded by protease K. So that means PMA2 is released by neurons without any envelope. Um, then we were super surprised because this is totally different from ARC capsids because ARC capsids was protected from degradation without the detergent. Yeah. So, so retro most all retroviruses are envelopes. So this is weird that it doesn't have one, right? Hmm. Yep. So this is puzzle number two, which is why. But of course, it's not. It's not a retrovirus. It's a precursor to a retrovirus, right? right? And actually, you know, so retrotransposons never yeah. really leave the cell, right? Um, so technically, they're they're na naked particles inside the cell. Um, yeah. So, but it does imply that there's this um, different way of getting out the cell, and so that's puzzle two, which is how is it getting out. <laughs> Um, without uh, a membrane, and so that's that's something that we still don't know yet. But um, I think it's it's interesting. Neurons, especially, seem to have a different lots of different ways of secreting molecules, mm. like peptides and um, other proteins that are functional, like growth factors um, and cytokines that don't seem to need a, a membrane. Mm. It's interesting because non-enveloped viruses get released mostly when the cells break, right? So you don't see any evidence of cells breaking to, to release them. The cells look fine in culture, right? Yeah, the cell looks fine. Um, yeah. This is kind of also one of the concerns that we want to figure out whether the release is because of the cell death or yeah, uh, actively yeah. released. Um, so first of all, the culture definitely fine um, they're uh, in uh, they're healthy and also we did a couple other experiments try to uh, figure it out we mutated the protein to uh, disrupt the formation uh, of the capsid and uh, when we uh, overexpress either the capsid mutant or the white type protein in the hex cell and then we um, test the percentage of release so the mutant release is impaired um, compared with the Y type, but the mm -hmm. um, uh, their health are the same. So this gives us another um, implication that this is probably released without the cell death. So the um, what what kind of change did you make? Was it a single amino acid change or multiple? Yeah, we did the. Uh, um, we have two mutants. One is a, a single um, amino okay. acid mutation at the, uh, at the uh, spike region. Uh, right. Another one is double mutant at the C and N terminal domain, C terminal domain interaction interface. Yeah. 
So what you're calling this spike region is this protrusion of the capsid, right? That yeah. It look, yeah. Look, it's not really a, it's not a membrane spike. It's just something that looks like a spike on the capsid, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, the protrusion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so we screened yeah. a few of them. Um, I mean, that was the nice thing of having the structure is that we could make really uh, well defined uh, mutations that we would predict should disrupt the capsid, and um, and so some of these looked really good. So the the disrupted capsids don't get out of cells. I'm sorry, I, I forgot what you said. Um, we can still detect the mutant. Um, okay. But the percentage of release is impaired. It's decreased compared with the Y type. Yeah, it's much much lower. It's it's um, okay. Yeah. And you 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 also find that these particles can be released from from human tumors, right? Uh yeah. So we test a couple of different cell line. Um, we find one um, because um, PMA two patients usually have um, uh, testis cancer and uh, lung cancer. So mm -hmm. we uh, test one lung cancer that um, highly ex express PMA two, and for that lung uh, human lung cancer cell line, we can detect PMA two in the uh, media, and also. Mm -hmm. It will be degraded. It's, it's degraded by the protease case, so it's also non-enveloped capsids released by human cancer cell line. But these are these are cell lines. These are cancer cell lines, right? You don't yeah. you didn't get any actual uh, t tissue from tumors, right? Uh, no, no, we haven't got it yet, that Not yet. Not Is yet. that what you would you like to do? That is that one of your plans? Yeah, that's one of our one of our future goals is to try and get some actual tissue from these patients. The only problem mm. is that they're super rare. Um, and, um, so yeah, we sort of just have to get, get someone at the right moment. Um, right. and oftentimes they, they, they they go through chemo and they, they sometimes don't even need, um, s surgery or anything like that either. So, um, but stepping back, so, you know, when we were doing these experiments and, um, and Junji showed that, that these capsids were coming out without a membrane, that, it was at that point there were definitely like, okay, well, maybe these uh, capsids are immunogenic because they're expressed uh, outside the brain in these mm -hmm. tumors, and they don't even have a, a membrane to protect protect from, from the immune system. And so the immune system really thinks that these are just viruses that are attacking uh, the body, and that's why you have these autoantibodies. And so that's the... Uh, hypothesis that that Junji wanted to test next. Let me ask you though, if so, you got you have a lot of these particles in the brain. Is it reasonable to assume that it's really compartmentalized that it wouldn't get out and trigger immune responses? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. So we we don't know. We we haven't been able to detect um, PNMA capsids in blood um, or hmm. or outside of the. Um, the brain yet. Um, so it could just be that they can't cross the blood-brain barrier normally. Um, and it could just be expression levels. So these tumors perhaps are just pumping these, these proteins out at yeah. super high levels. Um, but that's something that really needs to define is, 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 um, in vivo in the brain, when, when are these things released and how much of them can we actually detect? So if my my rudimentary understanding of tolerance, right? That when you're undergoing the development of the immune system uh, in the thymus, all the all the self proteins are all the proteins are expressed, and then any T cells that are reactive to self are, are killed, right? So why wouldn't these proteins be expressed, and and therefore you know there's no T cells left that would react with them? Yeah, no, I, I think that's those are good questions, and and also there seems to be a predominance of um, autoantibodies against neuronal proteins, and so yeah. why yeah. Uh, in the in the developing brain a lot of these proteins are not highly expressed until much later on, so mm. postnatal they're not expressed um, early in development okay. during embryogenesis, and so um, it could be that there's just a, a big delay in expression. Um, I'm also not an expert on this, so I, you know, um, yeah, would love some neither my <laughs> input, but, um, but I feel as, as looking at the literature at least that this is still a puzzle that it's not clear why these neuronal proteins uh -huh. are so commonly 
um, uh, not self-tolerized. Um, but one explanation as well for the, at least the PNMA2 is that um, we've ha we have some evidence that not all cells release PNMA2. So we've been looking at different cell types and cell lines. And so um, it could just be that even if they are expressed in the thymus, they're not expressed as capsids or they're not seen as capsids um, early on. Mm. Yeah. So, so Junji, then you wanted to know uh, if these capsids can make autoantibodies, right? So tell us, tell us about that. So, yeah, the next step, we want to test whether um, PMA2 capsids are autoimmunogenic. So basically the first experiment we did is to inject uh, mice with uh, mouse PMA2 capsids mm -hmm. to test the, its autoimmunogenicity. And uh, we are surprised to see there uh, was a robust uh, antibody production in those mice. Um, then also we want to ask whether um, it's this autoimmunogenicity is capsid specific or the protein monomers can also induce uh, autoantibody production. So we inject the capsid mutant mm, with only uh, two amino acids mut mutated. So, and uh, we cannot see any antibody production um, with uh, one injection as well as two injection. Um, so that means PMA2 capsids is strongly autoimmunogenic than the monomers, and mm. maybe monomers is yeah. not immunogenic. How uh, do you know what? Yeah, can you guess, speculate how the what the mechanism is? Like how come? <laughs> like are they are the B cells, T cells, if they are the one, I mean, it will be B cell reinforced since it's antibody. Are they recognizing the joints between two monomers mm -hmm. or, or yeah. are capsid um, because they're repeated close together? They bring a lot of kind of B cell receptor or T cell receptor activation just by bulking good. things. Very up? good. Yeah. Very good, Tim. You know your immunology. Yeah. <laughs> just making things. <laughs> Um, so those are some of the so, so that might be why they are more immunogenic. Yeah, we're, and we're yeah. we're actually um, collaborating with a group here, Ryan O'Connell's group, who's an, uh, he's an actual immunologist, um, <laughs> to look at the immune system and the activation. Um, and you're right, so they um, they could be B cell T cell combos. Um, there's um, there's evidence in the literature that a, a lot of these viral capsids actually have specific receptors that that the immune system uses to, um, you know, identify them. Um, so we're sort of intrigued by that, but there's also evidence that um, the epitopes, the structural epitopes are very um, immunogenic because they can get, they can catalyze mm -hmm. um, T cell activation. So in the mice that you immunized with, their own uh, capsids. Did they have any problems? Did you did they get sick or show any weird behaviors that might indicate something's going on? Um, this is an ongoing experiment. We are testing okay. uh, those mice. So uh, first of all, it's a pretty low end. We only have four mice in each group, either the <laughs> vehicle injected or capsid injected or the mutant injected. And uh, we see some something there. Um, so it's a it's a preliminary data okay. um, show that the capsid injected uh, mice probably cannot um, react to shock or or cannot uh, remember the shock. We did the fair conditioning memory test, ah, um, but yeah, but the um, mute capsid mutant injected mice I can both react to shock and also can remember the shock. Yeah. There, but yeah, uh, we need more uh, mice to right. make that conclusion. So, uh, explain this. So you have you have people with these tumors, right? And they're making uh, PNMA two. Presumably, they're making particles. That's making an antibody response. Do those autoantibodies contribute to to the tumor or to something else? I don't, I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah. So that's also interesting. Um, Oftentimes, when you um, overactivate the immune system in cancer, that's actually good because you destroy the, the tumor cells. Mm -hmm. The immune system attacks them, and that's actually 
uh, a whole line of therapy, CAR T cells, um, right. where you right. can uh, you know activate the immune system to k- kill cancer cells. Um, and and so we actually um, asked Ryan's lab about this, and they when they looked at the database, so they you can there's databases for different tumors that express different genes. And um, you can compare the prognosis of those tumors. And so it seems like tumors that where there is PNMA2 expression are actually less harmful or less, um, um, uh, that they, they, they don't show as much growth. So, so it could be actually a good thing um, eventually that the um, activated immune system will, will attack the tumor. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's something else that we're, we're sort of interested in looking at with Ryan's lab. But the downside of these guys getting released as capsids is that it's like throwing your trash out. Your antibodies might not know you made it because it, you just discarded it out as opposed to like a surface protein receptor. Um, so yeah, I wonder how that Yeah, works. so that, that's true. And um, uh, yeah, no, that exactly. It's, and so, you know, how good it is at sort of targeting the, the tumor cells is not clear. Um, but the other big question that sort of goes along the same lines that, that uh, you know, the question that Vincent asked, which is what are the behavioral consequences for, for the immune mm-hmm. you know, when you, when you vac- vac- vaccinate these mice? Um, one big question that we have is these antibodies we think can get into the brain. And, mm-hmm. and right. so then the question is, is, are they interfering with whatever signal uh, PNMA2 is responsible for because they could probably bind to the capsid directly? Um, versus perhaps there's just an, an infl- inflammation, inflammatory response that's more generalized, and that's why um, you you know you have these neurological symptoms. Mm. So we're sort of we think perhaps it's because there's a, a normal function of these uh, genes that is being uh, interrupted, but um, those are also ongoing experiments. You also got some samples from patients to see. If the antibodies would bind your uh, your capsids, right? Yep. Tell us about that. Okay. So um, the next is uh, after that we want to test whether um, the for the human patient those antibody are were also induced by PMA two capsids. So we did um, basically the um, epitope mapping. So we did first uh, in uh, mice uh, we. Put the we fragment. We think that if it is a capsid that induced the antibody production, uh, most of the epitope of the antibody should be located on the surface, uh, exterior surface of the capsids instead of the interior surface. So we fragment the protein to either the spike region, which is the exterior surface, or the uh, capsid domain, which is more likely. Um, on the interior surface of the capsids, and we did the ELISA uh, first for the uh, mice uh, derived antibody, and we can we saw that the mice derived autoantibody um, prefer to bind into the external spike region mm-hmm. instead of the capsid region, and then we move on to the patient antibody to see whether uh, to test whether they have some similarity with respect to the epitope, and we see we saw the similar uh, thing. Those patient antibody also prefer to bind to the spike region instead of the capsid domain. So this gives us a strong implication that um, probably those uh, patient antibody also induced by the capsids instead of the protein monomers. And also we did the uh, immunogold uh, uh, labeling basically, we put the human PMA2 capsids on the uh, grid and incubate with the human patient CSF, and we can see those PMA2 antibody can robustly bind into uh, human PMA2 capsids. Those is another piece of evidence that mm-hmm. um, those antibody are induced by uh, capsids. And we, I think we didn't say this, but the human PNMA2, we've purified that. It can also form capsids that look very much like the, the mouse. So that capsid mm-hmm. structure, we think, is very much concerned right. um, between the two. Of course, they wouldn't let us inject capsids into humans, so 
we can't do that experiment, but um, we, I think we, we sort of ha have to infer what the properties of these antibodies are to really figure out whether that's um, yeah. Yeah. likely caused by these capsids. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of the nutshell of the paper, but there's so many questions that we, we want to address and um, including um, what is the normal function of this, of this, of these genes. And so we've made mm -hmm. a mouse knockout that has this um, gene knocked out in the brain. Well, everywhere. And um, those might seem pretty normal, but um, Junji's now looking uh, to see if there's any uh, cognitive or behavioral um, mm -hmm. deficits. Um, and then we're also trying to collaborate. We're, uh, we're, we're trying to do some experiments with Ryan's group where we can actually take those tumors to the cell line, uh, overexpress PMA2 in them, and then implant them in a mouse. Um, and then and then see if if just artificially inducing this tumor in a mouse, whether we can see blood um, uh, in the blood, whether you get antibodies generated, and, and then mm -hmm. ultimately neurological symptoms as well. Yeah. So why is the why is the PMA two expressed in the tumor? Is it just a the, the general deregulation in tumors? Um. Yeah. It could be um, either um, degenerate, uh, dysregulation of the mm. gene expression. Um, a lot of, uh, some of those tumor ca are, are kind of uh, neuro uh, endocrine tumor. Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, when we did some pre um, prediction um, based on the uh, bioinformatics, so we, we kind of, um, guess that probably PMA2 promoter can be regulated by some um, uh, some uh, neuron specific uh, tr transcription factors like a neuro D uh, transcription factor. So um, those uh, neuro endocrine tumor mm -hmm. also sometimes have a high expression of neuro D uh, transcription factor. So probably that's the reason why they can promote the expression of PMA2 in tumors. And uh, there is one paper show that PMA2 can inhibit the apoptosis of tumor cells. Maybe um, this is a function though, but it could like uh, inhibit the ap apoptosis of tumor cells and uh, right. contribute to the tumor genesis. Hmm. Okay, and these are are there other kinds of tumors that have this same autoimmune signature that might involve similar uh, capsids? Um, well, there's PMA one, um, and so you know, obviously, a lot of these these genes are somewhat classified arbitrarily based sure. on information at the time, um, and so we we are interested in knowing was so a PMA one. Maybe it also forms capsids. Um, there are some of these other family members that, that could form, um, capsids, but, but whether there are other tumor, yeah, we think this could at least out of the, all the gag genes that are, that are known, I think only one in PMA one and two are the, the ones that are highly, uh, associated with, with, uh, these autoimmune disorders. Hmm. Interesting. So right now the future is you got you have the knockout mice and you're studying them to see what's what's the function. I mean, what else are you thinking about doing, Junji? Um, yeah, the big uh, direction is test the function of PMA two uh, in mm. the uh, test the function in the brain. And uh, another way we want to study probably another way is the disease, um, the perineal plastic syndrome. Uh, now. We, our paper show probably it's a capsid that induce uh, those antibody, but how can those antibody and the immune response finally cause the um, perineal plastic syndrome? How can this antibody and the immune cell move to the brain or how yeah. um, they influence the brain function? This, I guess, is another big uh, future direction. Yeah. It seems really interesting. You have this peripheral tumor that in induces neurological issues that's and that, that odd, often right? is the diagnosis that's the weird thing 
Yeah. Right. It's not right. like you feel a lump or you you you're coughing too much. It's you have yeah. neurological yeah. symptoms. Uh, and some of these can be. I mean, talking to the clinician, some of these um, cancers when they resolve, the neurological symptoms go away. But in other mm -hmm. cases, um, the damage is irreversible and it's too mm -hmm. late. So it's it is interesting and. Um, it sort of does touch on a lot of these subjects where I feel like there's not a lot known about like the self tolerance to, to neuronal proteins yeah, yeah. Um, and why they're so common. And there's, there's definitely a big debate of whether the antibodies um, themselves are, are doing something inside the neuron to disrupt signaling versus just general inflammation. Um, but the other complication I would say in the cancers is that, you know, once you have a tumor and you have all this, or activation of the immune system, you could also break down the blood-brain barrier anyway. Sure. And so that, yeah, that's sure. where you have this two-hit thing where blood-brain barrier is weakened by the cancer um, and then you have uh, the, the antibodies that get in there. Hmm. Right. Well, good story. Nice work, Junji. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, Vincent. Keep it up. How much time do you have left in the lab, do you know? I don't know. Um, I pretty really enjoy my love life here. Sure. So yeah, we'll, we'll see how the yeah, reviews go for this paper and what they are, what they are ask for, ask for next. Right. I guess. <laughs> uh, Junji, when you finish, what are you going to do next? Uh, now, um, for my project. No, I mean, for, once you're finished with your PhD, what are you going to do next? Oh yeah, so uh, I want to do a postdoc. Mm -hmm. um, in probably neuroscience, more likely uh, molecular uh, neuroscience. Um, yeah, so actually I'm pretty interested in the capsid field. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was interested in virology. So yeah. I want to like um, know more about the function of those capsids. Why um, those capsids are specific, I mean, at, at this point, we know arc form capsids uh, and uh, PMA2. Probably there are some other PMAs can also form capsids. And uh, right. um, a lot of those protein kind of uh, specifically expressed in the neurons instead of other cells. Why neurons need um, those endogenous capsids is kind of pretty interesting um, yeah. question. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, well, Jinji's been great to have in the lab, and I will I'll keep him as long as he wants to stay. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, he 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 will be um, he, he's got a bright future ahead. Wonderful. All right, well I know you have to go, Jason. So I'll wrap this up. That's Twin Thirty Nine. Show notes: microbe.tv/twin. Questions, comments: twin at microbe.tv. If you like our work, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, our guest today from the University of Utah, Junji Shu. Thank you, Junji, and really Thank nice you. work. Keep it up. Thank you so much, Vincent. It was great to be here. Yeah. Well, thanks to your uh, advisor for, for recommending <laughs> you to come on. He's got a lot of faith in you. It's oh, really yeah. good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jason. <laughs> Jason Shepard, University of Utah. Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Good to be back. Tim Chung is at New York University. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. And thanks, everyone. That was a great paper. Really, really interesting. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month.